cross the threshold. Go on the journey. No one can force you to go on a journey that improves your own life. But I do think that thinking in terms of adventure, thinking of yourself as the hero in your own story, is an incredibly powerful tool to I mean, just get the, the most out of this life. Welcome back to Purple Elephant Radio. As I've been doing the past few episodes, I want to start this episode off with a short poem from my new book, Off With His Head. And this one is called The Meaning of Life. Part 1. In the hunt for the meaning of life, you will go hungry. Savor the taste without the food. In the search for the meaning of life, you will get lost. Savor the place without pursuit. Frankel found meaning in his explorations of meaning itself, a mirror cracked and held to itself. And for myself, I sought the same, another cracked mirror in search of his reflection. I saw nothing but nothing. Desperate and afraid, I turned the mirror away. But suddenly, in a length of time I can't recall, the fear once felt transformed to awe. The land, the trees, the water, the falls, the snow, the sand, the sea, the goals, Specific and rich, nature had no need to hitch its purpose onto the coattails of language. It is self-designing and self-aspiring. It is self-refining and self-retiring. Part 2. Abstractions fizzle out like popped champagne when we savor the natural without disdain. Say nothing. Say nothing more. Though the question is asked, no words need speak it. Where on earth is my natural place when I'm told not to seek it? Say nothing. Say nothing more. Quiet as the ocean waves from far away, the moon has a pull on you too. What scares you? Tell me, what scares you? In the rage that makes our hearts stiffen, in the bliss that makes our smiles glisten, in the sad that makes our stomachs weigh, in the fear that makes our bodies shake, our duty is clarified by these sensations which concern us. Part 3. Follow the fear. It will lead to the den of the dragon. Slay the dragon. Behind him there is treasure. Carry all the gold you can. There is enough to last a while. Tomorrow, expect vengeance from his brother. These battles may last a while. All right, so... Today's episode is a little bit foreshadowed from that poem, but it's going to be about the hero's journey. And I'm sure if you're watching this, if you've been a longtime uh, listener, you're probably familiar with the hero's journey because I've talked about storytelling elements in the past. But I want to take the hero's journey from two different perspectives today. On the one hand, we have the storyteller who's going to actually use the hero's journey in the stories that they're telling, whether it's film, writing, um, you could even make a case for music, I would say, but film and writing will be the two major ones. And then on the other side, and this will relate to everyone, is going to be about how the hero's journey actually stands as a metaphor for anyone going through a either difficult time or um, a time that maybe they feel very passionate about something, but there is going to be difficulties, challenges along the way. So just to start off, I want to give a quick refresher, uh, sort of Hero's Journey 101 for those who have heard of it, but maybe aren't super familiar with the elements inside it. And a lot of times we'll break this into three acts or three parts. Um, but the way I'm breaking this down is going to be into 12 steps, the 12 steps of the hero's journey. So just to run through them, the first is being in the ordinary world. This is where the hero is in their daily life, doing what they normally do. Nothing crazy has happened yet. The second step is the call to adventure. Uh, we might also consider this the inciting incident. So whether the hero is being sort of beckoned by, hey, we need your help, we need you to help us, or if it's something that sort of lands in their lap, maybe a problem they didn't want to deal with, but right now they don't have a choice. 
Now, the third step is going to be the refusal of the call. And I really like this one just as it relates to our, our regular lives. Because as anyone knows, if you're going through a, a difficult time in your life, um, more often than not, on the first time the problem lands in your lap, you don't want to deal with it. You want to put it off to the side. So that third element of this major myth of the hero's journey is refusing the call the first time. Step four is meeting with the mentor. Now, you know, if you think of uh, something that really kind of follows the hero's journey well, we have something like Star Wars, the original one, uh, A New Hope, where it's Luke refusing the call at first, but it's his uncle, Ben, Obi-Wan Kenobi, who is the one that says, you got to go for it. Um, and so, again, I'll relate this to how this relates to your actual life in just a little bit, but that fourth one is meeting with a mentor. Then number five, and really this is kind of usually inspired by the mentor's advice, but it's crossing the threshold. So this is where you've heard the call to adventure, you refused it the first time, but now you're actually going for it. You're going into the unknown. Then number six is sort of a hodgepodge of a lot of different things. It's, you know, being tested along the way, finding enemies, finding allies. And so this, if you want to kind of visualize a normal plot structure, we often think about how we're always kind of ramping up the action to this climactic moment. That ramping up is what's included in this step six. So there's little trials and tribulations, but it's not the, the main battle. It's not the main fight. Then step seven is approaching the inmost cave. So after there have been little bits of trials and tribulations, learning about this new unknown world, um, the hero is suddenly approaching, and they're very conscious of it, approaching the true enemy, or the real reason they were called to the adventure. And then we have step eight, which is the ordeal. And now what's really interesting about the ordeal is that this is the point where the hero is facing that main villain, whether it's a inner psychological thing, uh, facing their greatest fear psychologically, or facing a literal external villain. But with the ordeal, this is not necessarily the climax. This is usually the point where the hero faces the villain, but loses the battle. Perhaps just barely getting by, barely escaping, realizing that they're actually unfit to fight off the villain, to fight off their greatest fear. And this is sort of that um, existential crisis point, being in the, the lowest of the low, that it can't really get any worse from here. And then we have step nine, which is receiving the reward or seizing the sword. So this is the point where, again, the ordeal, the hero just barely escaped, but Having come from that pit of the lowest low, they find some sense of inner strength, some inner resource, or it can be an external resource. Maybe they find a new weapon, literally sees a sword, but they have gotten something from their journey. But remember, the main villain, the main thing has not been resolved yet. Then we have step 10, which is the road back. But remember, at this point, even though the hero has received some rewards. They feel like, okay, you know, I went through a true journey. This was great. There is a bit of regret or a bit of grief. Like maybe there's a loose end. You know, that main villain hasn't been defeated. That main fear hasn't really been uh, overcome. And so the road back, the hero may actually go back to their ordinary life. But they feel like, you know, it, it's sort of like they went on this journey and Halfway through, they gave up. That's sort of the sensation in that stage, the road back, which leads perfectly into step 11, which is the resurrection. Now the hero is face to face again with their greatest enemy, perhaps at a much higher stake than before, but they have that reward and now they're ready to face the enemy. They have gained that, those inner resources, those crucial insights from prior in the journey. And they can actually do something about it and defeat the villain or overcome their greatest fear, whatever that may be. 
And so the re resurrection point is truly that point of, I mean, you can think about it symbolically or literally depending on the story, but death and rebirth. And that leads into step 12, the final step, which is returning home with the elixir. And again, the elixir is symbolic, but that basically means when you come home, you are a different person. You have become more mature, stronger, wiser. Um, yeah, just a, a leader in general. And again, it will vary based on the story, but there is no sense of regret. It's, I really defeated the villain this time, and I'm confident in my ability to do it again. All right, so you don't have to know all 12 of those steps. I just wanted to lay it out. I'm sure you knew most of that or just knew it intuitively. But what I really want to focus on are the, the two kind of critical juncture moments. So at the beginning, there's you know the call to adventure, but there's that first refusal to the call. And I think that's very symbolic. But eventually, the person does accept the call and go on the adventure. But then on the other side, at the end, there is that, okay, I faced the greatest villain, I faced my greatest fear, my greatest enemy, but I failed. But then you get another chance. You dust yourself off, you gain this new inner strength, this new insight, this new piece of wisdom. And then when you're faced again with that you know, great ordeal, you actually do win. You do overcome it. And so those two pieces, I think that's what you should get out of the hero's journey as it relates to your regular life. Now I want to tie this back to the thing that I read at the very beginning, that poem, The Meaning of Life. And what I want to argue is that we don't need to go on this grand search. We don't need to be looking at content all the time to figure out what's my purpose in life? How do I find my niche? Um, you know, what business should I start? And you know, that'll be my life purpose. We don't need to go on that road. I'm claiming that the purpose of your life, the greatest calls to adventure are already existent in your life. The fact is you may just be ignoring them, repress, repressing them, um, you know, steering clear of them. And unless you, you know, actively, you know, go headfirst into them, then more often than not, they're going to be placed on your doorstep, placed in your lap at the worst possible time. And so what do I mean by that? So I think the best example I can give for my own life is when I tried stand-up comedy for the first time. So this was a, you know, my freshman year of college, very, very shy, still socially anxious, um, but sort of slowly growing out of my shell. But I signed up for stand-up comedy, God knows why. Um, I read a, a memoir by Steve Martin and that sort of inspired me. But the point is, I was still terrified to do it and I did it anyway. But it's not like I did it anyway because I was scared. I actually did it because it was the scariest thing I could imagine. I actively went headfirst into that anxiety, like the, the worst of the worst. Um, and again, it's because I'm thinking of social anxiety. So if, for example, you weren't socially anxious, but maybe your greatest fear was, you know, being broke and, you know, being homeless and having to live on the streets or something along those lines. Um, a greatest fear might be, say, you know, going camping by yourself for like a week. So we can create these different challenges in our life that are not the worst case scenario. I mean, I can think of plenty of worse things than bombing at an open mic night um, for social anxiety, but it does give us a taste of overcoming that worst fear, or at least surviving it. You know, again, my, my first stand-up comedy set was awful, but I lived to see another day, and I lived to try it again. And so what I want for you, the watcher or listener, to be thinking about is right now, if you took sort of a mental inventory, a mental audit of the aspects in your life that are very anxiety provoking or anger provoking or frustration provoking 
or um, you know, any number of negative emotions. So the things that already trigger those emotions in you. I'm not saying find new things that make you anxious. If you can know what those are, and I do think anxiety is the best emotion for what I'm talking about here, but if you think of the thing that scares you the most, you know, that's a reasonable thing. I don't mean like, oh, I'm afraid of bears, so I need to find a bear in the wild. I mean something that, you know, you've seen other people do, but it terrifies you. If you have that thing, then I think there are plenty of opportunities to create your own call to adventure that sort of focuses on that on overcoming that emotion. And so again, in the meaning of life, that poem, I really focus on how I think the emotions that are naturally embodied in us, that we naturally get anxious because of this external thing, that that should actually be your North Star. And it's not just me saying this. I mean, someone like Stephen Pressfield, The War of Art, he has said a lot of times that Whatever you feel most resistant to do, that is actually a sure sign that you should be doing it. If you're not scared to try this new endeavor, um, whether it's writing a book or creating a feature film or singing, creating an album of music, if it doesn't scare you, then you may be off track. If it feels easy, you may be off track. And so that's a really, I think, counterintuitive way to look at the world, to look at meaning in life. But I think it, I actually think it's the most true way to find meaning in your life. And so we're at this point in 2024 where AI is on the verge of making all the content on the internet because it can make it so quick, so easily, so efficiently. And, you know, there's some scary things going on in the world with politics, with global conflicts, with maybe pandemics coming, with maybe a debt crisis coming. And those are scary. But what in your life can you do that would be facing a fear, that would be overcoming a fear? So maybe the thing instantly pops into your head, but maybe it's something you need to kind of let simmer. And I think what's really important is, again, in the hero's journey, the reason that I think the myth is so powerful, not just because other people have done it, not just because, you know, plenty of movies use the hero's journey structure. It's not like, okay, they did it, it works, so we'll try it. It's because it actually works. And it works as a guide for finding meaning in your life. And I think, you know, after watching, um, so Joseph Campbell, he wrote The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and he's the one that really laid out the hero's journey. I've been watching a couple of his videos and he was a massive proponent of taking the hero's journey myth and using it as a map for your own life to find meaning through your own challenges. It's a fundamental experience that everyone has to undergo. We're in our childhood for at least 14 years and then to get out of that posture of dependency, psychological dependency, into one of psychological self-responsibility requires a death and resurrection. And that is the basic motif of the hero journey, leaving one condition, finding the source of life to bring you forth in a uh, richer or more mature or other condition. So that if we happen not to be heroes in the grand sense of redeeming <clears throat> society, we have to take that journey ourselves, spiritually, psychologically, inside us. That's right. And so I think in our regular life that a lot of times we're in the, according to the hero's journey myth, we're in the ordinary world. We're not going out of our comfort zone every day. And I don't think there's a problem with that. I think that's totally fine. But the thing is, when we become maybe a little bit more depressed or sad about how mundane things are, when we begin to feel like life is repetitive, like the same thing's dragging on, like life might be meaningless, that the hero's journey can come into your life 
and act as this catalyst for a new sense of meaning. And so I don't want to get into all the philosophy stuff. I don't want to throw too many big words at you. But existentialism is a philosophy which essentially says, yeah, maybe there is no objective grand scheme meaning. But we can kind of create our own meaning in this life, even not knowing some divine plan of the way we're supposed to be. And I think the hero's journey is an exceptional tool for someone who has that existential belief that, you know, maybe things are a little bit chaotic, but I can create this sense of order by following the hero's journey. And just to be clear, it's not about, you know, things are chaotic, I want to create order, okay, great. In your real life, the hero's journey means overcoming one of your greatest fears. And to say that, you know, what's the point of that? I can just ignore my fear for the time that I'm alive. Well, that's fine. But when you begin to feel a sense of despair, that maybe it is time to face the fear, that maybe it is time to go on that call of adventure. And so I think it's really important for the average Joe or Jane watching this right now that you don't have to go on a hero's journey every single day. But that if you feel like you're going through an existential crisis, that really pinpointing what is triggering the negative emotion. Maybe it's not an external thing, but it's a feeling about your life like, uh, you know, you know I, I know I'm afraid of public speaking, but I don't want to do anything about it. When you're at that place, cross the threshold. Go on the journey. No one can force you to go on a journey that improves your own life. But I do think that thinking in terms of adventure, thinking of yourself as the hero in your own story, is an incredibly powerful tool to I mean, just get the, the most out of this life. So I know I'm rattling on about this, but the hero's journey is crucial, crucial to living a good life. Maybe it's not every day. Maybe it's once in a decade. Maybe it's once in a lifetime. But if you feel like, you know, you've just been kind of waiting around and, you know, skating through life, maybe you've had your little challenges, but nothing that was like grand, then maybe it's time to search for your hero's journey. And it's not an external search. It's about taking that mental audit of what are the things I'm afraid of right now? What are the fears that I've been ignoring? Um, the things that I know that I'd like to do, that I admire the people who are at that top level, but I don't think I could ever get there. Those things. Again, when I say fear, it's not, you know, facing a bear in the woods. It's about things that you've seen other people succeed at, but are maybe too afraid to try yourself. Now, to close this episode off, I want to give just a brief talk about the hero's journey for storytellers. So if you're not a writer, if you're not a filmmaker, you can kind of ignore this. But when it comes to the hero's journey, I remember when I was a freshman in college. Yeah, I might have learned about the hero's journey before that, but that's really where taking film classes, we learned about it in more depth. My first reaction upon really coming to terms with all the structure was, I want to do something different. I want to write a story that's not the hero's journey. I want to be the one to create my own structure and not have to follow that formula. And what I slowly realized over time is that the hero's journey, it's, it's not a formula. I think the reason people get confused like myself is that there are books like Save the Cat or, you know, how to write a screenplay that sells or, you know, all these formulaic writing books that we confuse those with the hero's journey. But I want to give you a quick sort of visualizer for this. Um, and if you're listening, I'll just describe it. But basically, we have all of the stories that have existed, you know, for the past 3,000 plus years. All the myths and um, stories that have already existed. And then we have Joseph Campbell, 
who wrote, I think around the 1950s, uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which is really where he talked about the hero's journey. What he was doing in that was not saying, okay, I know the greatest, easiest way to write uh, a screenplay that'll sell. He was making the claim that, sort of in this Carl Jung sense, that the hero's journey is this archetype that just naturally comes out of us. That is just a human intuition to think and write stories and tell stories in terms of the hero's journey. Um, and so I just want to phrase that, that basically Joseph Campbell overlaid the hero's journey on the way we naturally tell stories. So don't think of it like a formula. Think of it like, yeah, you're probably going to write the hero's journey anyway if you never learned about storytelling structure. Um, but you can use Joseph Campbell's, um, what he laid out, those 12 steps. You can use those just to double check. You know, if someone's reading your story and they're like, uh, it's a little bit dull here, maybe you didn't actually have this climactic moment. Maybe the, the hero, you're like, oh, there's only like a couple characters. Maybe you need to add a mentor to inspire the hero to go on the journey. Um, so I'm basically saying use it as a tool, but don't feel like it's a rule book. And I think looking at it that way makes it a lot, uh, it, at least makes me less reactive to try to be different than the hero's journey. And so, yes, as storytellers, we may realize that, you know, films, a lot of them can be mapped onto the hero's journey. That, oh, you know, I know the hero's not going to die, even though he looks like he's going to die. He's actually going to come back and defeat the villain. Like every Marvel movie, I'm not in shock if the hero comes out of the ashes and defeats the enemy. Because we have these expectations. And in a sense, yes, it destroys the, the movie magic, you could say. But I think the point of telling stories is in the specificity, not the structure. It's in the, the details, not the bare bones plot. So I, I, I look at it that way, of whenever you feel that sense of almost like a meta nihilism, like, oh, they all follow the same formula, all these stories, um, you know, what's the point of even reading it? I, all stories sound the same. Wherever that feeling dawns on you, I would say, Go deeper into specificity. Focus on, I mean, there's so many elements to story that have nothing to do with the hero's journey. You know, dialogue, um, you know, describing scenes, or if it's, you know, filmmaking, obviously you have a ton of different elements. Music, sound effects, um, composition, uh, dynamics, blocking, movement of actors. So much stuff that is irrelevant to the hero's journey that I just want to say, don't get sort of down about the fact that most things, most stories do follow the hero's journey. It has nothing to do with being creative or not. It's our natural human impulse. And so to close this off, I want to say thank you for listening or watching. Please buy the Off of This Head book. If you have any interest in it, there will be a link in the description um, to buy it on Amazon. And uh, yeah, a lot more episodes coming. I'm in a new studio space, which is much easier to film in. So, thank you. If you like this episode, it would mean a hell of a lot if you rated it on Spotify, on iTunes, left a nice review. Thank you.